there's kind of two areas that I think the biddable space is going to be focusing on this year. It's this kind of moment scenario, which is more suited to mobile. I want to know, I want to go, I want to see, etc. Um, but behind that is data. And data and behind data, of course, is a, is a person, it's audiences. And audiences and data or data management has become a real central part of paid media which I, th I find quite interesting because the currency is still very much about creative or, or keywords but it's about really having a true understanding about who that person is behind that sentiment behind that search behind that moment and one of the key investments that we made you know last year as you all know was was in a data management platform but I'm really quite excited to see how all channels take audience targeting and using that to really personalize how we communicate and, and get beyond just something simple like you know blue jeans or blue jeans size x to those moments so it feels a lot more personable and a lot more interesting a lot more insightful about the kind of consumers who we're trying to engage with i've been quite intrigued by um, the amount of data that you'll have on a customer by virtue of using the dmp or buying in third-party data um, and then flipping that across looking at the e-commerce side and actually um, e-commerce site owners trying to create personalized experiences um, based on the data they have on customers but fundamentally not having any data or not having a lot of data because they haven't really seen much of that customer before but here they are arriving at the site with probably a cookie or some other yeah. uh, bundle of data that the site doesn't have access to um, we're wondering how an e-commerce site operator might tap into that amount of data that's sitting behind that anonymous cookie and go, well, what can I change on, on my site layout in order to, to better tailor relevance to that particular user, even though I've never actually seen them before? I'm going to talk about mobile again, Lee, but specifically in relation to AMP or accelerated mobile pages, this framework that Google's got out there for, to allow people to have versions of their pages instantly cached, or not instantly cached, cached by Google, then instantly accessible by users um, at the touch of a button. Um, at the moment, it's relatively limited. I think it was designed primarily for news websites. It's been mainly adopted by news websites, but next year we'll see Google trying to push the boundaries of the framework to allow it to be relevant to more types of sites and people adopting it more, websites adopting it more as well. Is there a concern though that um, when we spoke about personalization, where we see that going, yeah. that actually we're taking cached versions of sites that actually we're not gonna see some of that personalized content or even worse, if people are reliant upon having personalized content, is that content going to be missing? What, what would be the default thing that's cached? Well, I guess you'd always have to have a default with any personalization setup anyway. And you're right in that this is probably the opposite of personalization in, in a way. Um, but the AMP version would be the unpersonalized version and then you have to make the trade-off. Is personalization more important to me than having this super fast mobile experience for users where um, because it's loading so quickly you're kind of getting a positive uh, impression of the brand by it loading so quickly. My, uh, my prediction for affiliate marketing for 2017 is that the, the emergence of the influencer model means that the consumer will start to operate like an affiliate. So a consumer within Facebook, let's say, who's got 500 followers and he's bought something online and he gets the opportunity to share what he's bought online through his social media network uh, to encourage his network to A, see what he's bought, see what he's interested in and potentially buy it himself. And if they buy through that link, through that specific share, then that original share gets paid an affiliate commission. Do you think that's going to erode trust in social communication it would be very attractive to the brand because for the brand there's all sorts of wins there's more reach there's only paying on performance like you do an affiliate um, there's more social media buzz so it's a kind of no-brainer for the brand but I think for the consumer I think it's still a bit of a, it's an awkward opportunity because I think that the idea of monetizing your friend base or trying to use your influence in terms of your retail choices to get your buddies to like what you like and ultimately buy what you like, it's, I think it's a bit contrived. Unless you're a, one of these KOLs, key opinion leader, you know, and, that, and then you're taking it away from your friend base and, you're, and it's all about what you as a KOL think about certain brands and certain products. And I think that's powerful. 
This year, I, I, I'm seeing the rise of the personal assistant, um, and obviously everybody's seen the likes of uh, Amazon Echo, um, Google Assistant, um, and, and Apple with their offering coming soon, built on top of, of Siri. So we're already seeing examples of where people can order something using their voice, but I think retailers are starting to move that to the next level of customer service as an example, whether it's somebody just uh, using their app to be able to speak to and order something from their favorite brand, or whether it's related to um, somebody in store uh, being able to maybe try on a garment and if they need assistance because they need another size of that particular garment they can ask for it with a, maybe a little uh, speaker or device in the changing room and maybe uh, that request is sent, sends a message to uh, one of the uh, store clerks who can come out and bring them the right thing that they need. So how would that work technically? Um, I'm going to see that there's a lot of the APIs that are now being exposed by the players, so uh, Siri and, and uh, Apple, we're looking at Amazon uh, and also Google um, Assistant, they're starting to open up their APIs and the commerce players who, also, who are starting to move to more of this open API model which basically means that um, you're able to call the e-commerce system and ask it for any information but you're also able to send any information to these e-commerce systems and so by um, extending this idea of the Internet of Things and also these e-commerce platforms being able to send and receive pretty much any kind of information, we're going to start to see people do some very clever stuff with it. Well, I think from the, the Crow and UX side of things, um, it's not so much the whole let's go mobile, let's optimize mobile, because hopefully we don't have to tell people to do that anymore. My hope for 2017 <laughs> is that we no longer need to do that. Um, but I also think the way we're optimizing mobile sites, um, also in terms of what you were talking about with the conversational UX, has really been the first word of 2016 um, in terms of UX. Uh, and I think it will grow even more in, in 2017, where it's basically a chatbot that you sit and you talk to. But also um, that we start to, to focus more on developing our websites for mobile first, and then from there expanding it onto desktop, because so often we, we have a desktop version and then two weeks before launch we go okay well let's just you know quickly resize and it will fit on the screen and then it's now optimized for mobile which is not the case that doesn't mean that just because it fits doesn't mean that it's a good user experience in any way